Good morning. We are getting back on the lectures regarding synchronous motor drive. So in the last class, I had said that we will uh, look at starting uh, power angle equation, equivalent circuit, and uh, hunting and invert V and inverted V curves in the next class. So as per that, we are going to uh, continue with the starting process of synchronous motor drive. Um, uh, I would like to show a few figures regarding uh, the cross section of synchronous machine. You can very well see that uh, this shows the uh, <clears throat> uh, longitudinal section of a synchronous motor drive. This is the shaft which is protruding on either side, and this is the bearing uh, of the synchronous motor drive, and this is the casing. What we see in blue color is the overall casing of the uh, synchronous motor. Uh, the inner cylinder, which is there, that is actually the um, rotor, and the rotor will have the winding inside, which is actually a DC field winding. So the DC field winding will be taken out and it will go through the uh, slip rings and dressers ultimately uh, to be connected to uh, the DC supply. And uh, the stator is in the outer side, that is the outer cylinder. And that is uh, having uh, the armature winding. And these are the three phase terminals and the neutral terminal. You can see four terminals are there. The terminals are shown here. These are actually the three phase R, Y, D or A, B, C phase and neutral uh, uh, terminals. And um, here is the cooling fan. If we need the cooling fan for uh, uh, cooling the inside uh, of the uh, synchronous machine, which can involve either stator winding and the stator core itself. So those are done. Uh, the cooling is done by the fan. And uh, this is actually the kind of structure uh, cross section you have for a cylindrical rotor and salient pole rotor cross section. The cylindrical pole cross section, you can very well see that uh, these uh, are the field windings which are carrying dot current and these are the uh, field uh, winding the carrying the return current and this what we see uh, D and this this is the damper winding that's what is shown as D and F is the uh, field winding and uh, as far as the stator winding is concerned uh, what is shown is only one pair of conductors for each of the Phases. So this is one phase R and R dash and S and S corresponds to the second phase and T and T correspond to the third phase. Um, and uh, salient pole rotor is shown here where you can very well see that again the poles are protruding. So the air gap is non-uniform whereas here the air gap is completely uniform. Here the air gap is non-uniform and uh, this is a four pole uh, structure. Uh, you can see the damper windings again along the uh, curvature of pole arc of the uh, each of the poles. And um, you can see again R, R, R and R, four of one phase winding you can see so this if you call r as the forward path which is having cross this is r dot which is having the return path again r cross which is again having a forward path and r dot which is having a return path the same way s is also having four of them and uh, t is also having four of them which indicates that it is a four pole configuration and it is a salient pole uh, uh, machine because the air gap is different along the direct axis and the quadrature axis. So here in four pole configuration, there will be this is one direct axis. This is another direct axis. So the quadrature axis will be in between S and T 
and it will be again S and D. In between S and D, you can see the quadrature axis that are appearing. So now let us slowly go over starting. So we said basically that the functioning of the synchronous motor is somewhat like this. You are going to have a, a, a stator, which is the structure is somewhat like this. And we are going to have the three phase revolving magnetic field created here. So this is going to be the three phase revolving magnetic field created here due to the three phase currents flowing through the stator conductors. Let me show the stator conductors as well. So let us say this is A, A dash. I'm going to have B and B dash and C and C dash. So I'm going to create a revolving magnetic field like this. This is A, A dash. Let us say this is B, B dash and this is C and C dash. So this has created a revolving magnetic field. So let us say maybe the North Pole is somewhere here currently and South Pole is somewhere here. And if we assume that I'm going to have this, uh, the rotor again somewhat like this, maybe it is made up of wound uh, field. It can be an electromagnet or permanent magnet or it can be a reluctance rotor. Let me assume for now it is probably a magnet, maybe electro or uh, permanent magnet. So let us say this is going to be S and this is going to be N. If this is S and this is N. Now, as this North Pole goes further, then this South is going to be attracted to that and it is going to be dragged along. Provided already if the rotor is up and running or if its inertia is extremely low, even if I'm going to have this running at 1500 or 3000 RPM, still I will have the rotor being dragged along. But if the rotor is heavy, it has a non-trivial value of inertia. In that case, it is going to take a while before it picks up the speed and synchronizes itself with the revolving magnetic field. So what will happen is the rotor will try to move a little bit. By the time it moves even a little bit, and this is South Pole and this is North Pole, you would see that already the stator pole, the South Pole might have come here. And the North Pole may be somewhere here because this is running at a very, very high speed of 1500 RPM or 3000 RPM. So this South Pole got attracted originally to the North Pole, which was here. Now it would see South Pole right away and then it is going to get repelled. So attraction and repulsion they will come alternately. Both of them are going to come alternately. And because both of them are coming alternately, there is not a steady torque. So you are going to be, uh, the machine is not going to uh, be able to generate a steady torque or unidirectional torque, whether it is clockwise or anticlockwise, it is not going to be able to generate a steady torque. That is the reason why Synchronous motors are not self starting. We are not going to have the synchronous motors self starting because of the reason, this particular reason. So there has to be a starting mechanism. So we might have an alternate or auxiliary motor called pony motor. So pony motors are generally or uh, they are going to be of lesser rating. If I'm not going to have uh, the entire um, load always connected to the shaft of the motor, the pony motor can be of lesser rating. So once you run the pony motor, it could be an induction motor or DC motor, which could be of lower rating. You start this and bring it very close to the synchronous speed. 
and then that way you are essentially giving a jump start or head start for the synchronous motor and after that you turn the field on then the field is essentially going to synchronize with the revolving magnetic field because of which the machine will actually run at synchronous speed so the pony motor will be uh, uh, starting it is like a starting motor which is going to make the machine move and come close to synchronous speed the moment it comes close to the synchronous speed you can switch off the pony motor instead you will switch on the field and because of the field you are going to see that it is getting synchronized with the revolving magnetic field and runs as a synchronous motor if we are not having the load permanently connected to the shaft of the motor coupled to the shaft of the motor only in that case we can use a pony motor of lesser rating otherwise we have to have the pony motor also of the same rating which is generally not a very viable option so this starting method is not a very good one because you need to have another motor and the other motor should also have almost similar rating to that of the synchronous motor the second type of starting mechanism is induction start synchronous run motor so what we mean by this is let us say i'm going to have my uh, uh, rotor somewhat like this so rotor has probably the field winding here which is the dc uh, uh, current carrying winding so let us say this is going to be all dot and this is all going to be cross so these are essentially creating magnetic pole north and south let us see but apart from that we are also going to have some conductors or rotor bars like this 1 2 3 4 4 here similarly we are going to have 1 2 3 4 4 four of them here and imagine this is extending into the board like this and on this side we are going to short circuit it with something like an end ring the same way on the other side also we are going to short circuit it with the end ring so we are essentially creating a situation which is very similar to the cage rotor bar of the induction machine because these are like cage rotor bars at that point what we are looking at is initially we are going to have the revolving magnetic field surrounding this so we are having the revolving magnetic field surrounding this this is rotating at synchronous speed whereas the rotor is at stationary condition so these bars are going to have induced emf and because of the short circuiting with the end ring there will be induced currents and this current in the cage rotor bar which is sitting in the rotor which generally are not called cage rotor bar these are known as damper bar we are not calling this as starting bar we are calling this as damper bar so i will tell you the reason why it is called damper a little later but this damper bar is going to have induced currents these induced currents are going to interact with the revolving magnetic field which is rotating at synchronous speed so this is going to create a torque so this induced current is interacting with revolving magnetic field so this is going to create a very similar torque which is similar to the induction motor torque so we call this as induction torque this induction torque will make the rotor rotate in the same direction as that of the revolving magnetic field so the rotor will pick up speed slowly it is like a short circuited rotor so uh, similar to cage rotor this will pick up speed in the same direction as that of uh, the revolving magnetic field and it is going to uh, start running but the speed will be less than synchronous speed the moment uh, 
the speed is very close to synchronous speed, we are going to turn on the excitation to the field winding. So initially, we may not turn on the excitation to the field winding. We will actually have the field windings also short circuited within themselves. So if I am going to have the field winding, let me probably look at again the winding what I showed here. So this is North Pole winding and this is the South Pole winding what we saw. And if we are going to have so this South Pole winding and North Pole winding, they are as though they are connected in series. This is the forward path and this is the return path. Now if we short circuit, so let us say this is the field winding and I'm going to short circuit it during starting. I'm not going to have this open circuited or neither am I going to connect the uh, positive and negative supply. I'm not going to connect positive here and negative here. So this is the North Pole, which is probably dot current. And this is the South Pole, which is actually the cross current. We are not going to have the field winding open circuited. Neither are we going to connect the supply. Rather, we are going to short circuit it. So let me try to explain why we are doing this to the field winding. Why the field is not open circuited. Neither is it connected to DC supply. This is during starting. So during starting, why are we doing this? This let me explain it a little bit. Because the field winding is supposed to be meant for creating MMF, uh, good amount of MMF, so the ampere turns Ni has to be larger. Which means we have to have the number of turns to be very large compared to the number of turns what we see for our armature winding. So armature winding number of turns is going to be in all probability smaller than field windings number of turns. So if we are going to have the field winding open circuited, whereas armature is supplied with three phase supply, then this is going to work like a transformer. So the field winding will have a very, very high induced EMF if a uh, uh, field winding is open circuited because it will uh, function like a potential transformer. So if field winding is open circuited, we will have a very high induced EMF. And in all probability, the field is generally meant for only less than 5% of the rating of the armature. So if the armature is about 1 MVA rating, then we are going to have only about five, uh, uh, fifth, uh, you know, five KVA rating for the field. Five or 50, 50 KVA, I think. OK, so that is going to be essentially 120th. So it is 1000 divided by 20. So it is essentially five KVA rating. That's what we are going to see. For uh, 50 kVA rating, that's what we are going to see for this particular um, field winding rating. So the voltages, if we say this is 11 kV and certain uh, ampere age, this in all probability will be 500 volts or 440 volts and corresponding current rating. So that is the way it is going to be. The current will be somewhat higher, voltage will be somewhat lower. The number of turns essentially will be quite high. And that is the reason why if we have 11 kV, the same 11 kV is induced, even if it is a one to one kind of turns ratio between the armature and field, still it is not going to be able to withstand 11 kV of voltage. It will be able to withstand only 500 volts or 440 volts, nothing more than that. So if we open circuit uh, the field winding, 
there will be high induced EMF. So insulation will be ruptured. They will not be, uh, uh, the insulation will not be able to uh, uh, withstand this kind of large induced EMF. So open circuiting cannot be done for the field winding. Rather than that, if we actually turn on the DC supply, if we turn on the DC supply, what is going to happen is you are actually looking at 50 hertz current passing through the armature. So 50 hertz current is passed pass through the armature winding. But if the field is slowly starting to rotate, whatever is the relational speed, relational velocity, relative velocity between uh, the field and the armature, that is going to be Ns minus whatever is the rotational speed of the rotor. So this is going to be the relative velocity. And this is going to decide what is the induced EMF due to the field being excited. What is the induced EMF in the armature, which is caused by the field rotating at such and such velocity? So we will have maybe 45 hertz, 40 hertz and so on, depending upon whatever is the relative velocity at that particular point in time. So we will have different kinds of frequency currents. It is as though you are uh, feeding the armature winding with multiple subharmonics. So due to which we already saw that it can create uh, oscillations in uh, the torque. You are going to have pulsations in the torque and some of them are going to manifest themselves in the form of breaking torque. So we can say if field is open circuited during starting then we are going to have insulation ruptured and if we are going to have is supplied with dc then we are going to have different frequencies induced in stator and hence breaking torque will be produced. So we don't want either of the things to happen. That is the reason why field is normally short circuited during starting. So once field is short circuited, uh, slowly that is also going to now contribute to uh, the breaking torque along with the damper bars. So uh, the induction torque is going to be generated and is going to start rotating in the same direction as that of the revolving magnetic field. The moment the speed reaches very, very close to the rotor speed and stator speed are pretty close to each other. At that point, we are going to remove the short circuit here. So we have to just remove the short circuit here and connect the DC supply. So there will be a, a kind of a contactor which will be opening the short circuit and connecting it to the DC supply so that we are going to uh, you know see that the synchronous motor operation commences and again when we are um, uh, kind of turning on the dc supply we have to make sure that if let us say this is the stator and let us say the revolving magnetic fields uh, uh, stator stator field is north pole here and south pole here and let us say i'm going to have my uh, rotor somewhat like this and I'm going to see that these are uh, the uh, one set of uh, field winding and this is the return path for the field winding. So if we consider dot current here and cross current here, this is probably going to create north pole and this is going to create south pole. 
and let us say the stator revolving magnetic field is rotating in this direction now if i try to turn it on the field supply like this this will be dot and this will be cross because north pole will be produced here it will get repelled so that is definitely not a good idea so if we see that this is the way we are going to have the uh, currents you know then it is better to turn it on only when we are going to have the south pole close to this not north pole close to this so when we want the rotor to get synchronized with the stator revolving magnetic field that mechanism is called pull in mechanism so pull in can happen uh, suitably only if we turn on the power supply to the stator uh, the rotor power supply appropriately as per the position of the revolving magnetic field poles so if this is the way it is i had to make sure that this becomes south pole and this becomes north pole so that it is attracted and it is moving in the same direction so this should become cross and this should become dot so we should have dot on this side and cross on the other side so this is very very important from the point of view of successfully synchronizing or pulling in the rotor with the uh, stator revolving magnetic field so the second type of um, mechanism which is induction start and synchronous run mechanism for the synchronous motor essentially involves initially short circuiting the field winding allowing the damper bars to uh, develop the induction torque and then allow the rotor to pick up speed very close to synchronous speed and eventually it has to uh, the field supply has to be turned on so that the pull in mechanism uh, successfully happens so that is the second type of uh, uh, starting mechanism the third type of starting mechanism is variable frequency starting so in variable frequency starting what we try to do is maybe the stator frequency is kept at 0.5 hertz or 0.25 hertz or something so the revolving magnetic field is at a slow speed so uh, the rotor will be able to synchronize so the rotor synchronizes itself or it is pulled in directly uh, by the magnetic field now that the rotor is already rotating along with the magnetic field now increase the frequency to 1 hertz then again the rotor will synchronize itself with the stator then increase it to 1.5 hertz 2 hertz and so on so you are going to slowly increase it to 50 hertz or whatever is the frequency that is needed so the in variable frequency starting we will have an inverter which is actually going to um feed the armature winding slowly with a very very low frequency and incrementally it is going to increase the frequency such that it is ultimately getting synchronized with uh, your uh, uh, stator revolving magnetic field so the rotor will always be trying to catch up to uh, catch up with the stator uh, three phase power supplies revolving magnetic field so these are the three different kinds of starting methods that are used generally and when we are talking about Uh, solid state drives or electric drives we are talking invariably about inverter so most of the times we may be employing variable frequency starting even in an electric vehicle normally what is seen is the battery is having a particular voltage so if i say that this is the battery and battery is having a particular voltage that voltage may not be directly compatible with whatever is the uh input voltage that is required for the inverter so in between we may have a dc to dc converter which will appropriately convert this voltage to a correct level and we are going to have the dc to dc converter probably giving a particular value of voltage which will be compatible with the input requirement of the inverter 
So now this is the three phase VSI. So this three phase VSI is going to now give out the uh, power uh, output and the three phase power output is going to uh, make the synchronous motor rotate. And this synchronous motor is coupled to the wheels of the electric vehicle. So this is how you are going to have the entire um, uh, structure of the electric vehicle configuration normally. So invariably, you are going to have variable frequency starting even with the three phase VSI that is present here. You are going to have variable frequency starting working very well for electric vehicles as well. So now that we have seen the starting mechanism, let us try to look at what is the power expression for the synchronous motor. So we said that field and armature currents interact with each other to produce the torque and torque multiplied by the speed will be the power. So if you look at it, uh, let us first of all try to draw the per phase equivalent circuit of the synchronous motor. For uh, deriving the power expression of, for the synchronous motor, let us try to first of all derive the per phase equivalent circuit of the synchronous motor. Um, when we apply a field current of IF DC from the DC side, let us say the open circuit voltage induced in the armature. on a per phase basis. Let's say that is E. We call that as excitation voltage. And generally this excitation voltage E is going to follow a similar equation as that of the transformer equation. So it will be 4.44 F phi multiplied by the number of turns in the armature. So this is how it is going to be. So uh, the uh, induced EMF or the, uh, uh, the voltage induced in the armature per phase will be proportional to the flux that is uh, uh, what is available in the air gap because of the field uh, uh, circuit uh, current. And if we call this as IFDC and if we are having the uh, magnet, let us say this is the magnet, which is actually an electromagnet, which has become a magnet because of this current IFDC. And if that is rotating uh, in a particular direction, let us say anti-clockwise direction or something at synchronous speed, this is equivalent to having a revolving magnetic field, which will be produced by a equivalent three phase current which is passing through the armature winding itself. So let me try to first of all get that equivalent armature current per phase. So if the armature current on the AC side had been IF, let us say AC, then uh, as per the revolving magnetic field theory, it will be three by two root two because peak of this AC current multiplied by number of armature uh, conductors that will be creating an MMF, uh, which is actually a rotating MMF. This should be equivalent to the actual rotating MMF because of this particular magnet. So this magnet is actually um, going to carry, the magnetic uh, field circuit is going to carry a current of IF times DC. And this is going to have NF as the number of turns in the field circuit. So from this, I should be able to say IF is equal to IF DC multiplied by NF divided by NA 
NF is the number of uh, turns in the field circuit and the NA is the number of uh, uh, turns in the armature circuit. And this has to be uh, multiplied by root 2 divided by 3. So this has to be used in the equivalent circuit as well as in the phase diagram because if we are representing all the quantities either in the equivalent circuit or in the phase diagram, they should all be 50 hertz quantities. We cannot be uh, writing uh, anything different from 50 hertz quantity. So let us now, with the help of this armature current, uh, the field current, as well as the armature circuit, let's try to draw the equivalent circuit. So let me uh, try to draw the equivalent circuit now, again, having uh, derived this expression. So if I am going to have, let us say, um, IF as the current that is flowing uh, in the field circuit, which is the equivalent AC current. Now, we are going to have a voltage induced, which is going to be uh, E. And this current, what is coming from, let me, let me show this the other way around. Let us say I have a, a current source, which is IF. And this is being passed through uh, a mutual inductance which is existing between the armature and the field. Let me call this as XM. And this current is flowing here. And on the other side, in the armature, we are applying a voltage of Vs. And there is an armature resistance RA. There is a leakage reactance which is XLA. This is the leakage reactance. And let us say a current that is flowing here is IS. This is the armature current. Now, this is representing the current that is flowing from the armature circuit, whereas this is the current that is actually flowing from the field. And the summation of these two flow here, which I may call as IM. So the magnetizing current can be written as IM, which is equal to IF, which is the equivalent AC current of the DC field current and the armature current IS itself. Now, using um, Norton's uh, equivalent circuit, because we have already said IF, which is flowing in uh, the uh, armature, IF, which is actually flowing in the field circuit, which is creating a uh, rotating MMF in the air gap between armature and the field that is actually inducing a voltage of E, which is the uh, which is working as the excitation MMF. So I should be able to say E is equal to J times XM multiplied by IF. So this clearly indicates that. As compared to IF, E should be leading by 90 degrees. That's what this says. Now, if I convert this portion completely using Norton's equivalent circuit, then I should be able to write this as um, this side does not change. This is going to have RA. This is going to have the leakage, which is XLA. And I'm going to multiply these two together. So I can write this as XM and I should be writing this as E. Which is uh, the product of XM and IF together. IF being the equivalent AC current as visualized from the armature side. Although the actual current that is flowing through the field is DC current. So this is Vs and this entire thing has to be connected together. Now these two put together, we are going to call this as excess, which is the synchronous reactance. This is the synchronous reactance. 
and generally in any of the synchronous machines ra is going to be really really small so we are neglecting it we are making this as zero and now the current that is flowing here is is one more thing that needs to be said is if i am going to have uh, e as the induced emf in the armature circuit because of the rotor excitation and in a motor the rotor will be following whatever is uh, directed by the revolving magnetic field that is created by the stator side supply or stator side excitation so if i say that this is going to be my stator flux linkage the rotor flux linkage will also rotate at the same speed as that of the stator flux linkage both of them will be rotating at a speed of synchronous speed but because the rotor follows the stator flux linkages it is being dragged by the stator flux linkages there will be an angle between them which is uh, given as delta which is also known as load angle or torque angle so psi r will be lagging behind psi s by an angle delta if both of them are in phase with each other there is no incentive for torque production they have aligned with each other the rotor is always trying to chase the stator flux linkage and try to align with the stator flux linkage so if the angle between these two is going to be larger then we are going to produce more torque otherwise we are not going to produce as much torque as we would normally produce so uh psi s refers to whatever is created by vs whereas psi r refers to what it is creating as e which is the induced emf so i should also write this as e angle minus delta because compared to vs angle 0 which is the reference which we are going to take eventually for all the calculation of current and so on we are going to write this as vs angle 0 as the source voltage and e angle e or eb you may call this as back emf or induced emf whatever angle minus delta as uh, the Uh, excitation emf that is due to uh, the field excitation that has been uh, pumped in from the rotor side rotor field circuit now let us calculate is based on so i should say from here that is which is the stator current per phase that is going to be equal to vs if i call this as the reference uh, uh vector uh, with respect to which i am drawing all the phase diagram so vs angle 0 minus eb angle minus delta divided by j xs this is going to be is and is is also going to have a phase angle with respect to uh the applied voltage because it's all uh, ac uh, quantities what we are talking about so let me write this as is angle phi this is going to be the expression for the current so i can write this as is cos phi plus j sin phi that is going to be equal to so i can say vs divided by xs uh um this is j so i should uh, talk about this as cos of or i should say minus 90 simply because j is plus 90 so i should say minus 90 so this is the first portion the second portion is going to be minus eb divided by xs angle minus delta minus 90 right so i should say real part and real part i can equate and imaginary part and imaginary part i can equate so is cos phi will be there will not be any contribution from here for the real part because it is only having minus 90 so cos of 90 will be 0 sin 90 will be 1 so this will definitely contribute towards the imaginary component not the real component here i am going to have minus eb divided by xs cos of uh minus delta minus 
and is sin phi will be having the component ds divided by xs as it is in fact it should be a minus sign because sin of minus 90 is uh, minus 1 so this will be that the other one will be eb divided by xs sin of minus delta minus 90 now this i can write this as eb divided by xs right sin delta because i can say cos of minus 90 minus delta i can write this as cos of 90 plus delta which will be minus sin delta so i will be getting eb by xs sin delta now uh the power that has been pumped in from the source if i say vs is the voltage and is is the current i should be able to write the power input so i should be able to write that power input from the armature and i should say this is per phase because we have what we have drawn is per phase equivalent circuit that is going to be um uh, whatever is vs multiplied by is cos phi we are taking everything as per phase quantities and phi is the angle which is uh, the angular displacement between vs and is so this is going to be the power input so i can write this as vs eb divided by xs sin delta because we don't care about really what is is sin delta so this is the expression for power whatever is the input power that will be same as output power if we say that the resistance is negligibly small which we have assumed currently so we are going to have this as uh, the power uh, uh, expression so as delta increases we will have more and more power being generated with delta equal to 90 at delta equal to 90 the power input will be the power generated is maximum so if delta is uh, becoming greater than 90 then the power will start coming down again only at delta equal to 90 we are going to have the power to be maximum so if i try to plot what is the variation of the power with respect to delta it should essentially show as though we are going to have this as the variation it is a sinusoidal variation if the delta becomes negative we are going to have i should show it on the other side as though the power will become negative so this is the way we are going to have so this is delta negative this is delta positive and this is zero so we are going to have the power to be maximum when delta is equal to 90 so this is the power angle equation and this is very very important from the point of view of understanding the starting and speed control of synchronous machines so let us try to look at what happens when we have variable frequency starting happening in the synchronous machine or when abrupt load change occurs in a synchronous motor so what is going to happen is we already said that uh, uh, for the three phase power if we if we talk about three phase power which is coming out of a synchronous machine is going to be 3 eb v i am not writing eb anymore i am just writing e as the induced emf in the armature winding itself which is the back emf which is opposing the applied voltage 3 ev divided by xs sin delta where delta is 
the angular shift between the uh, applied voltage and the back EMF. Let me show this in the form of a phasor diagram. Let us say this is Vs, which I am talking about as the applied voltage per phase. And let us say the current is maybe lagging behind by certain angle. So let us say this is Is. And this is lagging by an angle phi. So this is the armature current. This is the uh, applied voltage in the armature per phase. Now we have to uh, look at what is Is times J excess. That is the drop that is taking place in uh, the armature's uh, 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 you know, reactance, which is consisting of both magnetizing reactants and the leakage reactants added together, which we call as excess. And normally we call excess as synchronous reactants. So synchronous in, uh, inductance is LS. Synchronous reactance is 2 pi F multiplied by LS, which is the synchronous reactance. Now the synchronous reactance, if I try to look at it, I, I should look at the drop that takes place in the synchronous reactance. That should be exactly at 90 degree leading position because the voltage drop in a reactance will be leading uh, the current by um, uh, 90 degrees. So this should be Is multiplied by J excess. So if I say that Vs minus Is J excess is giving me what is EB or E. This is the back EMF. So I should be able to draw that as well. So I should say this is what is minus Is times J excess. So let me erase this and write this as minus Is J excess. So now if I just draw, this is going to be E or excitation EMF. And the angle between these two is going to be delta. So this delta, as delta increases, I am going to have more power produced for the same values of E, B, and Xs. So that is the reason why delta E is generally known as power angle or torque angle because as it increases, the torque is going to increase. Or it is also known as load angle because more the load power, more will be delta so that higher power is produced by the synchronous machine to make sure that it is scattering to the needs of the load. So power angle, torque angle or load angle, sometimes it is also known as rotor angle because if we said er earlier that this is the equivalent of rotor induced EMF or due to rotor field, it is the induced EMF manifested in the stator uh, armature winding and this is the applied voltage to the stator. So this is the angle between, in a way, rotors MMF or rotor flux and the uh, stator flux. So stator flux is almost in line with Vs, whereas rotor flux is going to be in line with E. So this is generally known as rotor angle. So when this happens, now let us say we are at 0.5 hertz. We are going to now come into the context of variable frequency starting. Let us say we are at 0.5 hertz. We are going to have the revolving magnetic field of the stator corresponding to 0.5 hertz. The rotor is still not moving at all, but rotor is going to now slowly pick up the 
uh, rotation because of the induction torque uh, or the variable due to variable frequency uh, starting, we are actually applying 0.5 hertz and uh, rotor magnets are going to be dragged along with the stator uh, magnet. So what we are seeing is maybe the speed is slowly picking up. Maybe it was at zero hertz, the revolving magnetic, uh, the rotor speed was corresponding to zero hertz to start with. Then it has become 0.1 hertz, 0.2 hertz, and it has reached almost 0.5 hertz. When it was not completely synchronized with uh, the uh, stator revolving magnetic field. If I say this was psi s, this must have been psi r due to which there will be an angle delta. So we will have the power maybe uh, which is generated as p1 watts. Now, as psi r synchronizes itself with psi s, we should have reached some p0 watt, which is great, which is actually smaller than p1. Once it synchronizes completely, this is going to become zero because two are synchronized, delta will be zero. So there will not be any uh, 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 power generated at all. Now I'm going to have the frequency increase to 0.7 hertz, let us see. Because it is 0.7 hertz, I'm going to have again um, uh, my uh, rotor, uh, my stator revolving magnetic field increasing its speed from 0.5, corresponding to 0.5 hertz to 0.7 hertz. So now again, delta will start increasing. So what will happen actually in terms of the power is, if this is the original power angle curve, initially probably delta was here because there is difference between psi s and psi r. We are going to have delta uh, 1 to be at this point and p1 what was generated was here. Now what is going to happen is delta will keep on decreasing because uh, this particular p1 will try to accelerate the uh, machine and the rotor is uh, slowly uh, going towards higher and higher speed, and it is going to slowly reach what is corresponding to 0.5 hertz, and it will bridge the gap between psi s and psi r, because of which we are going to have reduction in the power. So the power is going to decrease, and uh, as it comes to very low value, by then probably I have increased the frequency uh, from 0.5 hertz to 0.7 hertz. So abruptly the power can go to again a large value. Now again, because the power has gone to a large value, the rotor is going to accelerate. As the rotor accelerates, I'm going to have the uh, power decreasing, delta decreasing and the power decreasing. So I am going to see that repeatedly it is going to go back and forth like this. The delta and power values are going to go back and forth like this. And this is causing an oscillation in the uh, power generated. So if power value, I'm going to have probably the power is going to oscillate like this. Delta is also going to oscillate like this. In fact, it can go to the other direction also if it is possible. So this kind of oscillation is generally known as hunting oscillation. Hunting oscillations can occur when I am changing the frequency uh, abruptly from one particular value to the next value in the stator side, or it can also happen when power, load power is changed abruptly. So what is going to happen during load power changes? Let us say again, to start with, maybe I had the load power at a particular value, which is known as P1. And corresponding to this, I'm going to have delta 1 as my uh, uh, load angle. The angle between rotor and stator fluxes. 
And imagine this is connected to a constant frequency supply, which is corresponding to 50 hertz or 60 hertz. So armature frequency is going to be corresponding to 50 hertz. Let us say my rotor as well as stator both are rotating at a speed of maybe 1500 RP. They are synchronized with each other, but I'm going to have basically stator fluxes rotating at synchronous speed of 1500 RPM like this, and rotor is rotating slightly lagging behind, and that is essentially at an angle delta 1. Now I'm going to suddenly put on a load on uh, the rotor. And that demand, let us say, is something like P2. So this is the new power, P2. I'm going to have a new demand which is corresponding to P2. So corresponding to P2, I should have the load angle as delta 2. But unfortunately, Abruptly, I cannot expect an increase in this particular uh, angle from delta 1 to delta 2. So what actually is being done by the machine is from the synchronous speed of 1500 RPM, both were rotating at omega s initially. Now from 1500 RPM, it is going to come down to maybe 1470 RPM, 1460 RPM and so on. So it is going to release the kinetic energy, release kinetic energy from rotor. And in the process of releasing the kinetic energy, instantaneously the power demand from the load is being met. And in the process, I'm going to have less speed in the rotor. Because it is less speed in the rotor, the lag between stator flux and rotor flux or the stator revolving magnetic field and the actual rotor is going to increase. So from delta 1, it is going to become, you know, delta 1 plus some delta, delta. And then I'm going to have delta 1 plus delta, delta dash and so on. So it is going to increase slowly. The angle is going to increase slowly. So I'm going to have slowly the power being generated is increasing. When the power generated is increased to delta 2, actually it should have arrested any further decline uh, in the speed or it should have arrested at least whatever is the value of load angle that is uh, existing between the stator flux and rotor flux linkage. But please remember the speed is now only 1460 RPM, whereas the stator revolving magnetic field speed is 1500 RPM. So these two are different from each other. So I should say omega s minus omega r dash multiplied by t. That is going to be what is the incremental change in delta. This is going to be delta delta. So even after I have seen uh, the load angle reaching delta 2, I will still have further increase in load angle because of the fact that the speed is lower than the synchronous speed itself. So I am going to have further increase in the power. And if the power what is generated is greater than P2, that is going to contribute towards acceleration because please remember what we wrote earlier, J, D omega, by dt is equal to te minus tl. This is what we wrote as the mechanical equation. And if I just multiply this by omega, and I, if I multiply this by omega itself, I should be able to say this is whatever is the electrical power generated by the motor's mechanism. And this is the load power demand, which is actually P2. Whatever is left over, that is going to go towards accelerating the rotor. So now from 1460 RPM, it will go towards 1470 RPM, 1480 RPM and so on. And when it reaches 1500 RPM, delta will be arrested. 
delta cannot go beyond this value. So this will happen the moment the uh, speed of the rotor becomes 1500 RPM. Now, once it becomes 1500 RPM, now we are going to have uh, delta being arrested, but the power is still higher. The power generated is still higher. Because the power generated is higher, the speed can go beyond 1500 RPM. So the speed also goes through an oscillation. This is 1500 RPM. So we are going to have the speed coming down. And then it is going to increase. It is, it is going to increase beyond 1500. So this is going to go through the oscillation like this. So this is the speed of the rotor. When the speed of the rotor is going through such an oscillation, because of the variation in power, at the same time, if I try to look at what is the variation in delta, Whenever we are going to have the speed lower than uh, the 1500 RPM, I am going to have delta increasing. So delta will increase. And whenever I'm going to have the speed higher than the 1500 RPM, we are going to have the delta decreasing. So this will also repeat itself so the delta will oscillate like this until ultimately it settles down in a new value of delta, which is actually corresponding to delta 2. So this oscillation will take place repeatedly until this comes down to delta 2. And if I try to look at the power during this particular portion, the power will again, if I try to look at the delta increasing, the power would have increased. So the power originally was P1. It has gone beyond P2 and it has reached higher than P2. Then it will go through this oscillation and settle at P2 value ultimately. So the power is going to settle down at P2 value after multiple oscillations take place in the speed, the delta angle, and wherever it is matching exactly with the load power and the, uh, the load angle is delta 2, that is where ultimately it will settle down. This particular phenomena is known as hunting oscillation. The hunting oscillation takes place in synchronous motor drive. Whenever we are doing variable frequency starting at every frequency increase, it can go through an hunting oscillation and then ultimately settle down at uh, a, a particular value of delta load angle and a particular value of load power. Then again, when I modify the frequency, it will go through one more cycle of hunting oscillation and it will again settle down at a particular value of delta and a particular value of uh, load power. This will happen whenever there is an increase in the load power, abrupt increase in load power as well. 